it's a great privilege for me to just share with God's people here today about the journey, and uh, there's a lot of life experiences which I underwent. But just by way of background, I was brought up in a place called Alabama, in Claxton. Now, uh, like any township boy, and last year, November, I became 60. So I'm talking of many years ago. Like any township boy, you know, there were a lot of constraints those days, and the options were limited. But I always had destiny on my mind, and I always knew that somewhere, somehow, God wants to use me. But I drifted away, and for about 14 years, I didn't put my foot in a church. I was out there in the world having parties and jumping on tables when I'm drunk and all sort of things. But on the 9th of October, 1982, Jesus came into my life. And ever since then, instead of my life going south, it was going north. And it was the most defining moment of my life. And through His grace, I'm still standing. And what happened after that? I was, as Carl said, I was in the nursing profession. And on a good day, I was asked by the political part, uh, the, the ruling party, and after consultation with my pastor by then, Pastor Tim Semen, I then became part of the Northwest Legislature. From there, you know, I, uh, uh, when your name starts appearing at the golf club as an honorary member, then you should know that your time is up. And uh, when you go to Leopard Park, you'll find my name there. Uh, I was only having an 18 handicap by that time, but I'm an honorary member at Leopard Park because you can't play golf Wednesdays and Saturdays. So I left politics. I became too honest for the job. <laughs> now, having left politics, I didn't even know where I'm going. And out of the blues, I got a, a call from one of the recruitment agencies that they were looking for a CEO of the South African Bureau of Standards. I went through the whole interview process. And ultimately, I was appointed in uh, July 2004. Uh, and below, and you know, what, 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 what struck me when I walk in there, the atmosphere was thick. You can cut it, you could have cut it with a knife. It was loaded with suspicion and all manner of things just 10 days before my arrival. And some of you from Pretoria might recall there was a very unfortunate incident where the one guy who lost his disciplinary hearing during the HR checkout process, he shot his supervisor with a gun and he turned the gun on himself. The lady died, he died first and then Jenny Massa died uh, uh, three days after that at the hospital nearby, the little company of Mary. That's the environment which I inherited at the SABS. It was a classical example of a transformation effort that went terribly wrong because, you know, the focus was on the mechanics of transformation and not the dynamics of transformation. There's a difference between the two. You see, the mechanical side is how many black people must replace white people. That's the easy part. Let's draw an organogram, and then we look, it might look like a piano, and hopefully the sound will be melodious. It doesn't work like that in real life. There's another skill set, the dynamics, how to manage that process. And you know, the, what I discovered there there were legitimate expectations from young black professionals who were highly qualified but were bumping against glass ceilings. And on the other hand, there were deep-seated fears among some of the well-established white professionals who never worked anywhere else except the SABS, and they were world leaders in own name and right. And how do you balance these two things? Because, yes, there is a need to make sure that we have a much more inclusive, a much more diverse environment, but you can't just kick out people as if you are moving furniture here. 
And there I needed wisdom. And through God's grace, we went through a very intense process of engagement. And we, I brought in three people there. The, uh, the one guy is well known to you, a gentleman by the name of David Malapo. On Blackie Swart was, you know on Blackie Swart? On Blackie was also part of the team. You know on Blackie was a very, very rude uh, soldier. A little bit of colored blood in him. And uh, play white kind of the old man. And, and used racism, you know, so that people could not discover who he really is. Then I had Dr. Ketsu Mabusela, a psychologist, and we facilitated the process where we challenged these paradigms. And it was not just a racial paradigm. There was also an age paradigm. The older people knowing it all and don't take it too kindly if the youngsters introduce new and fresh ideas. There was a gender paradigm, you know, the technical environment is male dominated and male, you know, harder technische manner did not want to easily accept the leadership of female counterparts there. There was also a regional paradigm, head office knows it all and the guys in Bloemfontein and Port Lisbeth, they let me in the achterspeen gedrunk, meester van die ting. But there was also, you know, a divisional paradigm where the standards division, a commercial vision, and the commercial guys were the guys that made the money. And these were the guys that kept us ransom all the time. I'm going to leave if you don't do this. I'm going to do this if you don't do that. And we had to engage in a very intense discussion challenging these paradigms. And out of that discussion, yes, we had an 86% participation rate. I know of some of these meetings where people walked out. I've heard that. But I've also seen Auntie Anne going to Dineo and say, my child, I never thought that these are the things that you were thinking about me. Forgive me. And the two of them crying there and hugging each other because a lot of these paradigms were based not on fact but generalization. Somebody said at the Braai place after lofters, Zwartes a sword. Alle skellem, alle all those sort of things. Alalich. <laughs> and in the taxi rank, somebody said, you know, Makua, those white people, <clears throat> they are like, you know, their minds are like the concrete highways of Joburg. It's set in a specific mindset. And these generalizations shape their outlook when they come through the doors of SABS, and we had to challenge those paradigms. And these were hard processes, but of, out of all, you know, it was almost like a construction site. There was meaning to the mess that we were creating there, because the real stuff got challenged. And ultimately, we reached a stage where there was consensus on what the desired SABS should look like. What are the values that we will espouse? What's the roadmap for getting us from where we were in 2004 and the roadmap was up till 2010 while well, I left after uh, to, to 2009? But there was a clear roadmap what, on what needs to take place here over the next five years. And people bought into that roadmap. But I had to maintain the momentum because everything stands or falls on leadership. And maintaining that momentum, we selected champions. And the champions were not necessarily the people on the eighth floor. There were key people there that we identified from the whole strata of the organization to lead some of these groundbreaking processes. But I also, we also had to lead by example. By example, we had to have relational integrity. 
speaking the truth in love. And don't pull out the race card when you are held to account. And don't fall back into your default position. Ja, je weet, uh, jongens, uh, ek wil maar net waarski, je weet, die ander ouwe het ook die ding al probeer nie verlede. En, en dat het nie gaan werk. Ek weet nie hoe jy dit gaan rek. But relational integrity. I also had to make sure that there's consistency. A guy that I appointed as my marketing and communications executive messed around with my credit card after only being three months on site. I fired him. I couldn't care whether you're the brother of comrade so-and-so. You must go. <laughs> and once they saw that there's consistency in leadership, that we all held to the same standards, people started believing in our initiatives. Am I talking to the right audience here? We're talking diversity. But we also had to give authentic feedback. And from time to time, do certain probes. Now, every second week, I had these sessions called Martin's Moments With. And we will select about 20 people randomly from various strata, the cleaner right up to the top engineer in the pump uh, lab or whatever. And we will sit around the table and ask basically three questions. What happened? What's missing? What's next? How do they, currently, or how do they experience the current changes that we've introduced? Is there something that we miss, that I'm missing as the leader because you are down there at ground level? There might be certain implications there that I haven't factored in. And the moment you say what's missing, you must also be able to say what's next. And surprisingly, the amount of peer learning, how things were resolved amongst themselves there because one group could learn from the other. No, in our division, this is how we've tackled this thing. In our division, this is how we've done with X, Y, and Z. And then I also open up a, f a website where people anonymously could log on suggestions and stuff that's, that affects them. And this is how we disarm the rumor mongers. You know, there are certain people that only thrive in an atmosphere of chaos. Once you bring order and stability, you disarm them because their right of existence starts to wane away. Those people that pretend that, you know, uh, you know, uh, I see you went to the CEO's office. Uh, did you find him? No. Uh, he's too, I know he's very busy. Can I help you? You know those kind of people? The Absaloms of this world? The king is too busy. Can I take your case on? And I disarm the Absaloms, and people had direct access to the king. They could speak to me, and we could respond to them, not in a vindictive way, but in an honest and rational way. In our staff meetings, 10% of 10, 15 minutes on the business report, the rest was spent on a microphone session, where the microphone was passed around, and people can give us honest feedback. Maintaining the momentum was also to break the glass ceilings. You know, there were guys there, Om Havi and these gentlemen, 30-odd years, white coats, rode the standards and everything, but they hated meetings. They hated sitting in managerial discussions. They are technical people. They want to do the work. And instead of frustrating them in the technical, uh, in the managerial side of things because there's more money to be made as a man, I created the technical stream and a managerial stream. And instead of Amhavi being chucked out, he was made the chief technical expert on microbiology. <laughs> and he was even given an incentive to say, here is Dineo, here is Sergei, here is Anusha. Yeah, is Tsempo, your successor over the next three years from Harvey must come from these four people, and 30% of your bonus depends on it. And you're going to write down all the, ma the manuals and so on, and I'm, you don't like me, man. You don't like me. Okay, 
will arrange somebody for you, will write up these things. But it will be criminal, um, Harvey, if you leave after three years and all the knowledge leave with you. And you know, you will come up to me and you will say, I like the father no how mooi weer. Give us no how rege wees. And his dignity was not inflicted, and I didn't have to ask him for any other health and safety reports and all sort of things. His focus was to develop people technically. And I broke that glass ceiling. But in the meantime, Tinel completed her MBA, but she's stuck in a lab. When is she going to become a manager? We open up that glass ceiling for the nail and whoever. And when I left there, three out of six of my executives were females. And yes, the head of the unions was head of my strategy division because Abna completed his master's degree also at Turkey's at some stage. What am I saying, beloved? We also were to break those glass ceilings, but we did it for the right reasons. And we also made people aware that here are the game rules. In order to move from point A to point B, there is a competency assessment process that you need to undergo. We're not going to subjectively just take you to the next level unless all of you go through the eye of the needle. Because this is a quality institution, and therefore we need to maintain quality and these youngsters, the ladies, people from diverse, from the regions, a lot of Durban guys moved up and they, uh, a lot of Bloemfontein guys started occupying positions there in Pretoria and so on. There was a whole shakeup. Did I lose staff? Yes, but the majority of them remain. Oh, Frank said one day in a meeting, Those people you're talking about is not in this hall. They left here six months ago. Don't talk to us about that anymore. <laughs> then I knew the penny drop. We also celebrated achievements and made a big bash when certain things were accomplished, new learning experiences, that uh, there was a lot of peer learning that took place. What were the results? One, SABS. When I left in 2009, was the six was number six. We were in the top ten certification bodies in the world. In 2008, uh, I mean in 2006, in Ottawa, in Canada, I was elected on the ISO Council. I used to go to Geneva at least five, six times a year, sitting there with Dr. Paolo Scolari and all these guys there where South Africa's voice was represented in the highest standardization body in the world. They took note of us. The business became profitable. The environment became stable. We started the celebrating our uniqueness in, our diverse, in, in, in a diverse uh, environment. The staff turned over, but internationally we also expanded. When I left there, we had a client base of over 5,000 in 16 countries. And my last assignment was to put up an office in Shanghai, where we did pre-export verification either in the automotive and electrical division. We subcontracted ISO-credited laboratories before those things came through to South Africa. And I can keep you busy with a lot of things here this morning. What am I trying to say? Trying to say that we are depriving ourselves of the unique life experiences, talents, and capabilities by sticking to a specific way of life, and it's my way or the highway. Iron sharpens iron. You don't surround yourself with a lot of praise singers. I also want people that can challenge me. I want people that can sometimes sharpen my understanding about the situation. And sometimes it's that unionist that's such an irritation there. Sometimes it's that lady who keeps on moaning, but bringing her in and give her 
the right skills, she will become a champion in your environment. But we must also be truthful to ourselves. We don't just do it as a grudging compliance. We're doing it because this is what the kingdom is all about. This is what the kingdom is all about, as Steve has so correctly demonstrated to us this morning about Samaria. We owe it to this country, and let's move forward. God bless you.